I really have to say, I, I appreciate this quotation from the prior presentation that uh, my life was ruined by being the son of an anthropologist. Because actually I'm the grandson of an anthropologist, and I thought just the opposite, that I was like saved from a life of positivism, of scientism, uh, because of my early exposure to anthropology. Uh, and that would be my only optimistic remark in this uh, <laughs> talk. I want, to see, I want to defend a very negative uh, version of, of, of uh, of, let me say, of humankind, and actually not knowing at all, uh, I'm trying to figure that out in the conference, not knowing at all what you mean, uh, what the conference organizers actually mean by anthropological term. Uh, I'm tempted to do something quite crazy. Uh, let me get out of my watch so I can time myself while I do this. I'm tempted to do something kind of crazy, which is to define, so what the human being could be. So anthropology in a broad sense, a study of, of the human animal, not in the limited sense as a specific discipline, ethnography. So I'm, I'm tempted to try to define what the human being could be today, considering the current state of knowledge in the sciences and in philosophy. And I will do that in 15 minutes. Uh, I think the, the best way, okay, to go about answering this question is if we can, so I don't have time to do that properly, but to really try to construct well and rigorously, so I will do that quickly and schematically, uh, an antinomy which is extremely familiar to all of you, which is the antinomy between nature and culture. I think we confront that today in a, in a new way, and it becomes even more imperative to think what is the link between uh, uh, nature and uh, culture. Maybe if I can just... I just remember there was one other prefatory remark I wanted to make. You know, I was thinking on the one hand, today we often define human being in terms of a kind of hyper adapted, like a super adapted animal. So a human being is that animal that can always uh, adjust its behavior to the milieu in order to be able to dominate it. So in a sense, I put aside a little bit my written remarks to try to adapt uh, to the conversation today. But you know, the reverse side of this idea that the human being is a super adapted, more adapted animal, is that at the same time it's totally disadapted or non-adapted. It has no proper milieu. It always uh, exceeds whatever context you put it in. So there's no proper way of contextualizing a human being. If you want to think of it in terms of a nice kind of art, artistic analogy, a human being is not, let me say, the gestalt or the nice image, but more like a stain or rupture that doesn't fit into the picture. So we confront a kind of paradox between an ability to adapt, a kind of plasticity, and then a total failure to be able to adapt. And these two features, okay, in, in many scientific philosophical approaches are used to define human animal. So, back to the antinomy. How do we understand nature and culture today? Ah, sorry, can you go to the next? Is that okay? Uh, yeah. So, uh, quite quickly, uh, and by antinomy, I really mean uh, I would like to do this in a somewhat rigorous fashion, really in the Kantian style, which means I think I can make two arguments. Both arguments are really compelling, equally compelling. They're completely exclusive, and yet. Uh, they're not, uh, they don't totalize the field. So they exclude one another, but there might be a third or another option. So that would be the sense of antinomy. On the one hand, you could say culture today is nothing but an extension and continuation of nature. Uh, so we know that, for example, all the different mysteries of human existence, like religion and love and art, madness, etc., should eventually be explained in terms of brain function, uh, neurons, DNA, etc. We should be able to completely uh, naturalize the human being, uh, whether the project is called neural Darwinism or whatnot. Uh, science should be able to explain, okay, mysteries that were previously uh, assigned to so-called okay, human sciences. So mankind is part of nature, which is really an extension simply of the Enlightenment uh, project, Enlightenment. Uh, materialism. The twist, one of the twists we confront today is instead of nature being a stable entity, uh, more and more we confront a nature that's kind of chaotic, uh, protean, that's changing, and that our human interventions are also going to uh, cause a kind of revolution or change in nature itself. So that nature doesn't no longer stand for something kind of stable we can found ourselves on, but nature itself can be revised, changed, genetic modification climate change, and so on. I'll skip the beautiful quote from Karl Krauss. 
uh, about and this kind of cosmic dissatisfaction we have today. The nature itself in the forms, this is a wonderful quote because it's from, uh, I, I think, uh, early part of the century. He's already talking about climate change being kind of revenge of nature upon man and so forth and so forth. So that's the first part of the antinomy. So we can reduce to nature, yet we don't exactly know what nature is. I mean, this is the irony. The other part of the antinomy is nature, of course, is a product of culture. So nature, whenever we speak about nature, it's something always already mm, marked, figured, represented by a certain symbolic order, a certain way of speaking about it. Uh, just to give one stupid example that I quite like, is a, a specific product I really hate is this orange juice you can buy with the pulp added back into it. So we know it's an industrially produced orange juice you buy in the garden, but you can also buy the orange juice with the kind of pulp put back into it. So as if it was a kind of semblance or reconstitution of nature within this totally unnaturalized uh, culture. Now, uh, one, another way of understanding this, this dichotomy, so this, this antinomy, would be to look back to good old-fashioned, yes, uh, psychoanalysis and Marxism, uh, because they had a very interesting position on this, you know? On the one hand, uh, both Freud and Marx were extremely suspicious, you know, about the category of nature. That nature would seem to be a kind of social program that was simply naturalized, so removed of its social character. Uh, uh, the idea that, uh, uh, well, as Lukács, you know, Gerard Lukács once said, uh, nature is simply a societal category. Or in Freudian terms, uh, Lacan once said, you know, nature is just a fruit of cultures. So the idea that you would have a sort of psychology a developmental scheme that would be normal, natural, and then we would describe cultural deviations from it. Or that, for example, a uh, capitalist system more and more today is simply understood as a extension of basic human nature and competitiveness. So Marxism and psychoanalysis have taken a great distance and actually criticized uh, thoroughly the concept of nature and its ideological mm -hmm. use. On the other hand, what's quite interesting is both Freud and Marx, of course, put themselves on the side of natural sciences. So especially, so in Engels, that's still interesting to discuss, to read today, even though it's quite forgotten, the dialectical materialism, the idea that we should also be engaged as Marxists in the natural sciences, and of course Freud himself was a neurologist, so interested fundamentally in brain science. So there's an interesting kind of split, this antinomy within okay, these classical uh, 20th century disciplines. Two more ways uh, I can articulate this antinomy. One is the, the famous debates in the science studies. So on the one hand, you could say that, you know, science, and of course that's true, is a human practice. And we can study it as a human practice in the way that scientists act, for example, in the lab, the way that they pose their problems, the kinds of metaphors they use, suspending the question of scientific truth itself. And in a supplementary move, one could even argue that the way they arrive at truths is dependent on a certain metaphorics. It's a classic debate in science studies. So science is a human fact, a human discourse, a human creation. On the other hand, uh, one can say that scientific research more and more today is actually looking at the human being itself, so trying to unravel those mysteries of uh, subjectivity in cognitive neuroscience, in evolutionary biology, and so forth, as if this antinomy would come full circle. So on the one hand, we can bracket truth claims of science and understand it as human praxis, as a product of culture. On the other hand, the scientists themselves are, as it were, running around the circle and already explaining the cultural theorists in terms of okay, scientific precepts. So that the cultural theorists themselves will be explicable in terms of uh, scientific model of the mind. Uh, last way to understand this antinomy is the problem of the linguistic term. I understand linguistic term a bit better than anthropological term, what that means. The linguistic term, uh, uh, focusing on this question, where does language come from? What is the origin of language? And again, there's two answers to this question, both of which are extremely compelling. Uh, if you're a philosopher, the, the correct answer to this question is don't ask it. Uh, we don't know where language comes from, and there's no way to answer that question. Uh, to kind of make fun of Heidegger a little bit, you would say, there is no origin of language, language is an origin. Language is the very opening up of the human world, and we can only ask about the origin of language 
from within a world already opened by language. So language, as it were, is chasing its own tail. And again, to make fun, if I, if I may, of Heidegger, uh, if you pursue this line of inquiry, you end up in a kind of language mysticism where you reflect on the mysterious origin of language that can never be understood and yet inhabits our thought from the inside, preventing us. So, in other words, one can never step outside a symbolic system, so as to gain a kind of neutral position on it and observe its kind of emergence from a non-symbolic to symbolic okay, reality. Uh, uh, in other words, okay, to extend this argument, uh, language should be understood ex nihilo as a kind of novel emergence. That's not something that's supernatural, it just comes into nature from, I don't know, God's creation, but in a way, it just simply contingently, by chance, emerges, and once it does, it changes everything. That, 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 that uh, summarizes, let me say, one of the more advanced uh, philosophical, philosophical arguments today. Many people would su subscribe to a version of this. Another way of stating this, and this goes to uh, the previous presentation, uh, that language can't be considered as a code, as a kind of animal code, or as a representation or reflection of a pre-given reality. Uh, that language is defined, so by its autonomous, and self-relating character. And I believe that's what so philosophers meant after Saussure, who meant something else with it, but what philosophers meant when they said the order of language signifiers is cut off from signifiers. It meant that, or it means that, in a way, what's am amazing, strange, what we should be amazed at uh, in language, is it's not only about things, meanings, but primarily it's kind of about itself, it circles around itself. Uh, 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 so the miracle of language, you can say, is not that words allow us to communicate, that words mean something, but rather that words can always mean something other than what they say. That a word can always slip, that you can always not understand. Another interpretation is possible, etc. Um, so to inhabit language, I finish this, this section quickly, to inhabit language means, so to be a symbolic animal, means not that you're directly plugged into meaning, culture, etc., but that you kind of have a sensibility for the totally nonsensical, ridiculous, arbitrary character of language. That that's a positive aspect of being able to inhabit uh, language. There's a nice anecdote. I read that recently, a letter between uh, Jacques Lacan and Roman Jakobsen. And Lacan says to Jakobsen, do you remember the story you told me last night that the parents got angry because the child said something like, you know, the cat goes bow wow and the dog says meow. And the parents were punishing the children. And Lacan was like, but this shows that the child actually is not psychotic. The child understands very well how language works. So once you're able to make these kind of felicitous errors, then you are, as it were, well installed. You're able to manipulate language instead of being just purely uh, psychotically spoken, controlled by language. Uh, last little footnote. Uh, that's why also I think among philosophies of language, I make a little plea. I think that the book of Gilles Deleuze on this logic of sense is quite interesting. Uh, the reason why is he says, if you want to understand what language is, don't start from meaning and then assume that kind of nonsense, word games, etc. are a secondary sort of deviation. No, start with nonsense, uh, word plays, stupid slippages, esoteric words. Start with somebody like Lewis Carroll and then you understand really what language is about. And that everybody, so even people who aren't skilled artists or playing stupid board games all the time, or I don't know, always at the psychoanalyst's office, even so normal people have a basic understanding, a basic uh, sensibility is a better word, for this inherently nonsensical, arbitrary, okay, self-relating paradox. That's the first half of the antinomy. The second half is much quicker. If you look in natural sciences today, what do they say about language, emergence of language? Quite interesting. Uh, but they say that this problem of self-relation and of slippage, of break, we can already read that in nature. So the classic philosophical argument that you can't ask about the origin of language because it's already there as, I don't know, condition or horizon. In fact, we can look at non-symbolic, so pre-human reality, and we can detect the same structure. So perhaps language is just an evolution from the same structure. So what is that structure? It's what sort of uh, very intelligent so evolutionary biologists like Stephen Jay Gould, for example, call exaptation, which is not simply adaptation to a situation. To exapt means that there's a break or a rupture, a 
gap between the origin of something and its use. So something can emerge for one reason, but then be used for some totally other reason. This is, this is the mechanism people use to describe now to kind of blind uh, uh, natural selection or blind evolution. Uh, uh, which Gould, I mean, interestingly relates to Nietzsche in Genealogy of Morals, this idea that if you want to understand cultural forms, you have to divorce the idea of where they come from, their origin, why they developed, and the later use that they serve, which can be completely separate, miles apart. So this supposedly sort of non-symbolic nature also contains so this phenomena of exaptation. Uh, just to give another quick example, a uh, very interesting French biologist, Francois Jacob, uh, talks about natural selection as a kind of tinkering and also refers to Levi Strauss, so this concept of bricolage. So not a kind of design, but the things are just kind of hung together and then one thing so that serves one end can be diverted for another end, much like okay, human language. I was waiting for time. Well, I'm doing fine. Good. Ten minutes more. Okay. So that's the way I would construct so an antinomy. How do we understand nature and culture? The way I would solve it, I mean, just to answer a question in a brutal way, is to say, and now I come back to um, yes. I come back to a very interesting intervention from the morning, a uh, question that was asked about uh, the concept of indetermination or indeterminacy. I think in a way, the solution to this antinomy nature culture is not to try to merge them in some way, but to realize that both sides are fractured from within, or that both sides, in nature and in culture, there's a fundamental indetermination, a gap at work, uh, a disadaptation, if you want. Uh, uh, and this indeterminacy, okay, I have to say. Maybe the one twist I would add is, so this fundamental lack of properties, indetermination, I, I will explain what I mean by that a bit more, this lack of essence, at the same time, never really appears in, it appears in a pure state. So at the same time, human being could be understood as a juncture between nature and culture, a lack of essence. That lack of essence is always expressed or structured in a kind of provisional or contingent structure or essence. So, in other words, there is not a, a simple opposition between what's determinate and what's indeterminate, but there's, okay, in the Hegelian way, there's different types of determinations of that very indetermination, where the indetermination doesn't disappear, but okay, it remains, as it were, alongside the determination. I try to make that a bit more concrete. I know that sounds quite abstract. I think, okay, to be very schematic, there's three moments in history of philosophy, in our recent history, where this idea of indetermination is posed very clearly and very compellingly. Uh, and being a good, I don't know, a bourgeois sort of leftist humanist thinker, I would say that the three moments are Freud, Marx, and Descartes. Uh, Freud, how does Freud understand indeterminacy of human animal? That the sexual instinct does neither has a preformed idea of what its objects should be or what its activities are. So what defines human being for Freud is a kind of lack of instinctual roots. He doesn't have a kind of pre-given program or, to use kind of contemporary metaphors, there is no kind of pre-built software that immediately tells human being what you have to do to find satisfaction, or sexual enjoyment, to find partner. That there is a kind of lack that has to be filled in by cultural knowledge. So, kind of, there's, a, let me say, a lack or something missing, an indetermination on the level of nature, which is then compensated for by symbolic activity, culture, but then you have to add a third twist, that this very cultural knowledge or symbolic activity also from within is something inconsistent. So it gives the human animal a kind of anchor, but a kind of anchor that is, as it were, anchored in nothing. It also is a kind of self-relating, okay, arbitrary system. This is kind of paradox in Freud. There's a nice story, you can even see this in mythological expressions, in Longus, this story of Daphne and Chloe is deeply Freudian. The idea that it's a pastoral love story, basically, that two innocent children uh, fall in love, and 
and they, they want to express their love physically. So they want to have sex, but they simply don't know what to do in this ridiculous way. They don't know what to do in order to enjoy each other. So a third term has to come in, the old woman, and explain to them how sex works. I mean, this is deeply Freudian in the sense that you have a lack. An animal has no problem with that. They have certain signals, codes, they copulate. It's not problematic. In the same sense it is for human beings. Okay, Marx. Where does indeterminacy come in Marx? Now I, I sound really old-fashioned. But after all, what Marx is, what the interesting claim is, and still for today, is why we have to ask again, is proletariat the substanceless sub subject? Why is proletariat universal subject in Marx? It's not the proletariat working class is a specific group of people in society that somehow have a historical advantage. They understand what society is about. They, they, uh, they uh, internalize knowledge of alienation and therefore make revolution. I mean, this is all, let me say, kind of the school book, a bit ridiculous cartoon book Marxism. The, the reason why for Marx, uh, proletariat is universal class is because, so his argument, I mean, simply put, I think, is that capitalism necessarily in its structure produces poverty, period. Capitalism will always produce poverty, first step of the argument. So that's not an accident of capitalist organization, but a necessary product. And second part of the argument is anybody at any time could arbitrarily become poor. There is no guarantee of not becoming poor. Therefore, poverty, impoverishment, becomes the universal form of subjectivity in capitalism. <laughs> this is the argument, so this is basic on the same argument of Marx coming out of, so Hegel, when Hegel was talking, okay, I'm sorry to make a little detour, but it's, it's kind of interesting. When Hegel is talking about poverty and philosophy of right uh, uh, and this concept of rabble, uh, Pöbel in, in German, but it's more fun even to translate it as like scum. Like, you know, when Sarkozy is talking about the rakai, the scum. So, what does Hegel say about the scum? In a way, they never get integrated in the social totality, but the social totality always produces them. So, it's the part in philosophy of right, you don't know what to do with these people. Later, it shows up as proletariat in Marx, but the interesting twist in, in Hegel's argument is, uh, you know, the scum is not only poor, but people who refuse so, to work, so people who refuse to support themselves through labor. So the real form of the scum, and this is already in Hegel, but in the contemporary society it's much stronger, the real form of the rabble, the scum, in the contemporary sort of constellation, is of course the speculative for the financial capitalists, because these are people who refuse to work, to actually support themselves through labor, but yet, in just a pure gambling mode, uh, uh, embody this idea of pure exclusion from totality. Okay, so Marx, this proletariat, is a totally substance a subject, and what it discovers there is that the only human essence, and this goes back to 1844 manuscripts, the only essence of human being is to be constantly producing itself. But not producing itself, let me say, in classic, Aristotelian sense, that it has some capacities and it makes them actual, so it brings what's inside to fruition, but it has no starting point. It produces, as it were, out of nothing. When it produces something, as it were, in the past it becomes obvious that that was a possibility, but at that moment you don't know. So that the human being is in a way a constant rupture or constant surprise. Okay, and the last point I make, good, five minutes. We can do Descartes. But the last point I want to make is Descartes. Why maybe presenting a slightly different understanding of history of uh, this history of enlightenment that, that okay, we heard this morning is it one story one can tell about Descartes and enlightenment project, and this is deeply Heideggerian. Okay, pseudo Heideggerian is what you have is a, a mastery of the object or mastery of nature. So that Descartes invents subject as kind of pure reflexive knowledge. Uh, thought think, able to think itself, and then poses outside of itself the object, which it gradually tries to, okay, understand, colonize, to bring into its orbit. Uh, you, can, you can cite, okay, the, the, the encyclopedia project of the Enlightenment and so on, to try to, you know, bridge and bring the object into the orbit of the subject. But you can tell quite a different story, uh, uh, that not that the history of Enlightenment is this gap, decision between subject and object and kind of trying to colonize that space, but that what was very strange in Descartes is, of course, I think therefore I am, I can think myself, but what is this I that emerges at that moment? Nothing. It's a purely substanceless I. There is no quality. Every quality, so every property of that I, uh, including 
racial, sexual identity, cultural customs, etc., can be doubted. Descartes had a very beautiful term. He said, while I'm doing this so that nobody gets suspicious of me, I will adopt, I mean, I'm not going to break laws, I don't take my mind game, my thought experiment too seriously. He says, I adopt the morals of my country as a provisional morality. So this moralité provisoire. Uh, the, the morality no longer has a strong foundation, but I still will follow the rules. But after all, Descartes, I think, also understood that there was a radical move, a kind of desubstantialization or indeterminacy in the subject. And one of the most beautiful later expressions of that is actually coming from Diderot. I would maybe de emphasize the Diderot of the Encyclopedia Project, but that wonderful story of the, ne the Rameau's nephew, which we have today thanks to, okay, thanks to the Russians, thanks to Catherine the Great, that was saved from oblivion. Uh, the story of, of Ramos' nephew, where you see that at a certain moment, subjectivity comes to understand itself. I could be this, I could be that. It understands all of its properties as contingent and flailing, as it were, in a kind of cultural, uh, yes, uh, kind of cultural miasma, a kind of cultural indeterminacy. And in a way, this later expression, so of Ramos' nephew, of not of being everything and nothing, of always being other to itself. I think expresses a kind of truth already contained in, uh, in uh, Cartesian Cogito. Okay, last 30 seconds. Uh, I just want to relate this now to a political problem. Um, okay, I'm sorry, I'm not, obviously I'm not presenting an elegant presentation, but simply some theses to debate. But to relate this to a political problem, the problem of indeterminacy, I don't talk about politics in general sense, but just one political problem, uh, the problem of university. So the problem of university disciplines. I think that difficult question today, and the question of anthropology, is not so much, at least for me, quarrel. It's not so much a quarrel, this classic problem of uh, the quarrel between the disciplines, uh, or the problem of disciplinary identity, or the interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinarity, or so on, but it's simply a problem, I mean, really a threat, that today thought, or academic research, is more and more, in order to be legitimate, it has to be attached to certain values or norms. It has to be a uh, uh, fit into a pre-given mold. And I think this is a problem much more, ironically, I think Europe, Western Europe is more advanced than the U.S. In, in this. That in order for thought, so philosophical research, let's say, or the more, most abstract form of thought to be legitimate, it should serve some value. And that can be a very good value. It should make us more tolerant. It should make us more open-minded, accepting other people. It should make us more critical of the society. It should allow us to construct, you know, I just read this article in England, that it should allow, allow us to construct a big society, as they say, uh, in London. What is, what is the problem with this? I'm totally against this kind of uh, fake humanism. I think today we need more to defend the idea that thought has absolutely no meaning or value whatsoever. That it's simply purely autonomous. That in a way it witnesses bears witness of thought in general, bears witness to this possibility of pure indetermination uh, without being, so without having any particular uh, value. It's in, it might be interesting today to even rehabilitate the very retrograde old image, Greek image of philosophy, that it's something that you do when you don't have to worry about any practical problems of life, you know, when your slaves have already fed you, uh, cleaned the house and whatnot, that philosophy is purely a moment of self-reflection in leisure. But this leisure is no longer understood in terms of a break, a time off, a kind of entertainment, but would be, okay, now to make fun of Heidegger, to sound like Heidegger, that kind of leisure would be the hardest, most extreme sort of form of work. Uh, maybe to end with the last sort of irony, uh, I could put this point slightly differently in saying, you know, Marxists would always say, every, every, every other line, what we need today is concrete analysis of concrete situation. You know, so you repeat the word concrete and material so many times, you almost imagine that what they want is that the word would leap off the page and become a thing in the kind of almost psychotic sense. So concrete, concrete. Instead of this idea of concrete analysis of concrete situation, probably today, very paradoxically, we need just pure abstract defense of abstract uh, thought. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? So we have like 15 minutes for uh, a liberating discussion. Uh, you, you said that instead of normativity, we should have 
indetermination. But that itself, in the very sentence, the way you structured it, is a normative claim. Yes. And it's quite a conventional one as well. Because uh, traditional humanism has always advocated self-determinacy as a norm. Going back to Kant and his emphasis on autonomy and his definition of enlightenment as maturity and autonomy. So, so it's already normative what you're advocating and it's quite traditionally humanistic. Yeah. Do you agree? Uh, I mean, of course, I smile. I like the question. I thought of these like five minutes before lecture. Uh, okay, uh, two answers. I mean, why not humanistic and then why this problem of normativity? Which, okay, I have, let me see, some weak answers to both. Yeah. Humanism, for me, very simply, humanists are not. Humanism doesn't mean, so in the classic Greek sense, cosmological sense, it doesn't mean I can understand the universe on the model of my body, or even I can understand my mind, that I have a direct access of my mind. I mean, humanism can very well admit that the universe is completely inhuman, doesn't give a damn about me, uh, that my mind, in a way, in a Freudian sense, is completely inaccessible uh, to, my, to my, maybe there's desires that are completely Accessible. The, the humanist turn is to say, I can take that inhuman element and I can dominate or conquer it. So, you know, also there is a book, you know, James Glyde, this great science writer, he wrote a book, fascinating book about the history of information. And of course, the last chapter is, but can't we give the information a bit human, human touch? Can't we recolonize? Can't we give human meaning to information? That's humanist. This, I think, is not necessary. This, this, this second book is just not necessary. And the problem with the indeterminacy, the normativity, yes, uh, I would like to defend, but maybe I'm wrong, I'm thinking a bit off the top of my head, I would like to defend a kind of paradoxical normativity. Of course, if I say human being is indeterminate, but in a certain way we have to defend it, yes, I fall into paradox. But uh, maybe see if this is appealing to you at all, because it's a very strange defense I would make of thought or reason. Uh, I would say maybe thought is totally useless. Uh, I'm willing to admit that. that. It doesn't make you more tolerant, that even most advanced, intelligent people, civilizations, are most barbarous, violent, horrible people, etc., uh, etc. Et uh, that thought cannot be attached to any value whatsoever. I cannot find a way to justify it, but if it disappeared, still I would miss it. That's, that's my normative claim. <laughs> I want to say, I can't say why it's good, but if it disappeared, I would miss it. I also think it's maybe not a bad way of thinking about love. I mean, you can also say, Really, if you love somebody, maybe they don't make you happy, uh, they're terrible, they prevent you from getting your work done, all these horrible things. But if they went away, you're still going to miss them, you don't know why. So, this is a kind of structure, maybe it's... There they are conveying something, so there is a certain ethical foundation behind language. And he's claiming because of it, we have some institution like religion, or like law, which, has, which are emerging from the necessity or any communication to have a foundation. Otherwise, you can be freely speaking uh, uh, about nothing if there is no value, if there is no ethic. So, foundations are absolutely important for society, for language, something like that, which doesn't mean that foundations are determining. But foundations are ontologically there, so it's not a kind of free nothing, no values, nothing. It's a pure, 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 pure undeterminacy in terms of absolute absence of any positivity. I think it's it's it, it, it's it, it's a wrong way to think about it. But you know, I mean, so this is just the danger of okay. I, I maybe give an overly somewhat provocative formulation. You know, I agree. I mean, in fact. This was, okay, I can put this in an overly complicated Hegelian way, that there's not a distinction between determination and indeterminacy, but there are very concrete determinations of an indeterminate openness. Uh, the way I would have developed that, so to actually answer the question of my title about this idea of clinical anthropology I didn't even get to, is that what's so interesting in psychoanalysis, and what I think is one of the most productive ways of approaching this problem of human question today, is an alliance between uh, evolutionary biology, cognitive neuroscience, and psychoanalysis, is psychoanalysis never made this mistake, this stupid mistake of anti-foundationalism, that, oh, everything is open, uh, there's no ontological commitments, there's no foundation. No, psychoanalysis understood human being radically indeterminate. There is no, let me say, pre-given program, which means that there are three basic forms. We see that indeterminacy, so in psychoanalysis. Neurosis, perversion, psychosis. 
that those are highly structured, developed typologies. So, no, what, what I wanted to argue, what I would have argued is those clinical types are not just sicknesses, but the ambition so of psychoanalysis as anthropology was to understand those clinical types also as basic types of being a human being and being determined by the structure. But again, last point, you can play a funny game with lack, with the term lack. You can say human being has, so on a biological and on a symbolic level, you can say human being lacks animal roots. You know, it doesn't have claws, we don't have good fur, but we also don't have the good instinct programming. But you can say that's not a lack. It's only a lack when you compare it to animals. It's also a positive phenomenon. So neuroplasticity, etc. You can say the same with language. Language fundamentally lacks any kind of anchor, anchor point, into the real. But, of course, that's the power of language. It doesn't mean anything means anything. But as I tried to explain, it means to really use language and to mean something, you have to have a sense that it's rooted in nothing. So I want to get over, I think this is an old boring debate about, you know, either we have foundations or chaos. I don't think any really intelligent philosopher was ever holding that position. That this was an unfortunate... So, uh, let me say, I mean, deep so there. Hans Ulrich. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think Alaya was first. Alaya doesn't think she was first. Then. Okay. <laughs> Let's change it. I had a um, revelatory experience the other day. I got a book about the German author Bertolt Auerbach. And I learned that this 19th century author was the internationally most renowned German writer during the 19th century. Um, and Tolstoy put 10 exclamation marks behind his name and Mark Twain desperately want, wanted to visit him. So he was all over the place and it was the biggest name. Today, nobody knows him. I sat together with really well-educated people. Nobody has ever heard the name. Now, what was his problem? He wrote realist novels, but he did exactly what you said. He combined them with values, you know, elevated values, Bildung's values, how to become a you know, better person. This was his idea, to educate through novels. Had he been, you know, relevant, related this to neurosis, perversion and psychosis, of course, he would be a really great name today. So I just want to reaffirm that what you said is really absolutely true for literature. Now, literature is a huge laboratory for how humans are and what they can be, especially in the non-normative and non-standard form, in the you know, uh, extreme forms. And, and this is what literature is all about. So I think we are agreed about this. The question that I have is, what about the discourse of the humanities? We're talking not yeah. about literature, we're talking about humanities. Do we ask you, uh, people in the humanities, we all get salaries from, from our universities, do we have to mimic the uh, poets, the, the writers, the authors? Do are we doing exactly the same thing? Or uh, is there a difference bet between the discourse of the humanities on the one hand and what the writers do? Oh. Uh, you, you put me in a great embarrassment, I don't know. Uh, I think I, I understood you up to the, <laughs> to the very point you posed the question. <laughs> why, why, could I just ask you really, what is the homology, what is the link? Why do you want to say that we, let's say we in the humanities, so are doing something fundamentally the same as literature? I'm very interested in this. I'm totally with you when you say the writers or the artists don't have to care about values. Uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe okay. people in the humanities yeah. may care without yeah. going totally off I, okay. the track. I understand. Let me, let me say something to really clarify my position, because as much as I would like to say I hate values, it's a ridiculous position. What I really mean, more, more subtle, is that I have no problem with values. I have even no problem with liberal values. I mean, good. Tolerance, good. Like, good society where there's less violence, great. What I say is that thinking... So what, I, what I want to defend, and I think that's something you can defend within the humanities, not just for artists, right? Is that thought is a very strange thing. It is necessarily imbricated in, bound up with values, point. But it never fully is absorbed in or coincides with those values. That is the very strange thing about thought. And I think that the problem today, so for humanities, people work in humanities, and in Europe, in the US, 
in Europe, the problem is, you know, in the old good old days, the state used to be a counterbalance to the market. But now the state is just agent of the market. So if you want to be defended against the market, there's only one alternative of uh, individual rich capitalists, like, defending you against the market. That's why the U.S. universities are private. They don't have to worry so much about justifying their intellectual activity. But the moment you say, if I have to do a research project, and I have to formulate it in terms of, you know, doing this research on this philosophical problem of subjectivity will also help us to understand the conflicts in the contemporary society. Oh, I just shudder, I am a shudder, it, it horrifies me. Not that it's not true, but the idea that thinking somehow has any kind of master at all, even a good one, even one I agree with, I think, and eventually this will happen, this, this idea that in a weird way thinking I'm sorry, it is not in the service of something. And there is an absolute homology with problem in contemporary art. Maybe it's even worse than the arts. If you talk to any artist, they always say, art makes you more tolerant, it opens your mind, it's good to have art for society. Ah, screw it. I mean, maybe art is no good, but still we want it. I mean, okay, all right. Now, Hans I, I have three things, I don't know whether there's three questions, and uh, it's the type of statement that if I forget it, I wanted to say that at the end, can you please elaborate on that? Uh, the first one refers to your, uh, to the double discussion already about, uh, it's interesting, it comes back now with your paper about indeterminacy, and I claim there's no contradiction. There would be a contradiction if uh, indeterminacy was turned into a normative claim. But uh, I think the way it was described this morning, that's at least what I meant it, it was just used descriptively. It means it is a lack of determination. You will not say uh, in which specific way those disciplines refer to each other. Right? I mean, so instead of saying it has to be an anthropological way, it has to be in this way or that other way, you don't say anything about it. And I think then you do not turn indeterminacy into a norm. We just discuss here would one have such a pattern or not? And if you say no, then this does not mean a no, I think. Secondly, um, this is about the question, I mean, re rehumanizing the humanity. Um, when I read it in the time of the colloquium, I said, well, this is more or less a mild pun, rehumanizing the humanities. Uh, in the first place, and let's refer to the German situation, I mean, you couldn't do that pun with Geisteswissenschaft, the sciences of the spirit. I mean, that would be kind of weird, right? Spiritualizing the sciences of the spirit, I'd rather not do that. Um, the point is, is there a... The point, I mean, it's a, it's a question to you, not that you stated it, it's just because you happened to be the last discussion. Uh, I mean, do we think, do you think that there is a serious point uh, about that pun? That the humanities should be more humane, or more human, that's already a difference, and if so, why? I mean, I, I hope and I think you're going to say no, not necessarily. But I mean, is, is this is this a question? Is this a question we take? We, we, we should take seriously. And I think, as somebody may think it, if we don't, uh, why would we not? I mean, my my reason would precisely be that once again, that uh, makes things too narrow. That uh, kind of exclude certain possibility with, with whichever concept you have. But once again, I mean, this is an addition to the title, so to speak, the appendix of the title of the colloquium. And the question is, I mean, will we make this a key issue of the discussion? And finally, uh, this is about your, wasn't it a discussion, was it at the end of your, of, of your presentation? Uh, we were talking about the concept of thinking, and I liked it a lot. You said you have no concept of thinking, but it is one of those things that if they disappeared, uh, you would notice it. Yeah? Now that means that there's one concept of thinking that you do not seem to apply, and that's the Cartesian one. Because I think cogito means thinking uh, in, in a way synonymous with consciousness. I mean, the cogito, I have a consciousness, therefore I am. I think that's what it means, and then we say, well, okay, consciousness is always temporally constituted. Then, of course, it's a thinking process. I do think, uh, and I mean, my hope is that we disagree on something. I do think that you mean it the way you were describing it at the end, in a way similar to Heidegger. But Heidegger is always saying this, this kind of anti-intellectual things. Well, <coughs> we have lots of philosophy, but philosophy doesn't think. So, I mean, you cannot say it in a way. 
we would miss it because if you say it in the sense of consciousness, well, if we had no consciousness, we would not miss it. Because you need a consciousness in order to miss anything. So you can't only miss it if you have a consciousness. So your concept cannot be that. It can actually only be uh, a concept of thinking that you were implying that implies something like events. I think that is what we haven't said yet, but that's important because we were talking about this openness throughout the day. And of course, openness for what? Well, openness for something that can happen unexpectedly. And that would mean that something happens to you in thinking, and that would mean it doesn't depend on you, and that would mean it comes from outside. Okay. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so thank you very much. I mean, three <laughs> big questions and so forth. Uh, so I will try to just be very, because it's late, so I try to be very punctual, just unsatisfactory answers. First, first on the normativity, on the question of normativity, I obviously have a problem you don't. I mean, I'm in, a, I'm in a more embarrassing situation than you are, because you can argue that I'm a positive, I think if I understand your argument, you can argue I'm a positivist. I see that there's an indeterminacy, so I, I make an observation. I, I want to make a stronger claim, which means that I have to defend uh, and that goes to the very first question. I have to defend a kind of, I have to accept weird formulations like a normativity of the not normative. I want to do, and that will come to your third question. I want to defend something in thought, but to which I can't describe a value to, and to make that argument serious. So I have a problem. I think you can avoid whether that's whether that's my advantage or, or your advantage. Okay, we leave to the. To the, the second question about humanities becoming more humane. Uh, my personal opinion is that every advance, major advance in human knowledge came with destruction of humanism. And today, while people in the humanities are just talking about, uh, I'm sorry, the worst thing that ever happened to philosophy, I mean, also breaks my heart, is that the real philosophy departments today, the money, and the, uh, it's, all, it's all applied ethics. I have, this is just death of philosophy. It, it has, philosophy is there to solve ethical problems. I don't know uh, how many organs I should donate. These kind of things. I mean, the, that was the end of philosophy. I think that today, the real who are the real anti-humanists and people who are making more progress than the stupid philosophers? I mean, they're scientists. They're people who talk about is the human mind a computer, for instance. Radical anti-humanists. I don't think about human personality. I just think of you as a computer machine. Like I think every major advance in human knowledge came from somehow breaking a humanist prejudice. Okay, that's my simple. And then the third question. <coughs> Big discussion, obviously. The, I can just put my cards on the table. My, what I feel very solidary with is a very Lacanian understanding of Descartes, where Cogito was not, let me say, the big mistake that covered over some truth that then we have to uncover uh, by maybe going back to, I don't know, what Greek thought. But that Cogito was a rupture, and that actually, if you develop the idea of Cogito, it doesn't lead to self-consciousness or self-mastery, it leads to an idea of what is unconscious. Because after all, in the end, that Cartesian subject that is the pinnacle of thought, at the same time, can't be thought because it's stripped completely bare. So Lacan has a very interesting argument, okay, that would require a much longer conversation between, and that in, I think contemporary philosophy in a way is split between a Heideggerian reading of what Cogito means and the Lacanian reading, I would just say, if I could end with a paradox, I think what we would miss if thinking were to be extinguished, I can't remember, but what I think we would we miss uh, when thinking is too much sutured to or connected with values is not so much consciousness. What we risk losing a bit is unconscious. We lose our sense of unconscious precisely, indeed, and then I agree with you. Precisely as that which manifests itself as something unpredictable, as a glitch, as something that doesn't fit in the context, as something that disturbs us. And more and more, I mean, for me, what humanism, I mean, that's why the title of all, what me rehumanizing of humanism, my knee jerk reaction is let's get rid of all of those glitches. Let's get rid of unconscious. Let's have a good value society. So, uh, you know, I think. Uh, um this big quotation, uh, quotational mark, uh, whether we should go back to redefinition of Cartesian Kagiti is a good point to break for for, for today, uh, keeping in mind that we have tomorrow to to move on. Thank you very much, Aaron.
And uh, yeah, thank, thank you, everybody. Спасибо за участие и научная часть на сегодня, я так понимаю, завершена.